Hey there, and welcome to Up Next in Commerce, the show where we get to sit down with e-commerce leaders on the front lines of digital innovation. I'm your host, Stephanie Postles, CEO of Mission.org. And today I had the pleasure of chatting with Nicole West, who serves as the VP of Digital Strategy and Product at Chipotle Mexican Grill. We talked all about how Chipotle is excelling in the digital QSR space. I mean, their digital sales in 2021 surpassed $3 billion, so they're obviously doing something well. Plus, we heard how she thinks about evaluating the ROI when it comes to adding any new tech into their business, including AI and cobiotics. And lastly, we heard some contrarian thoughts from Nicole towards the end of the episode that I think are relevant to the QSR space, but also to all industries in e-commerce. All right, let's get into it. Before we dive in, I wanna give a quick shout out to our partners, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. They not only help make this podcast possible, but they are the number one commerce platform. So go check them out at salesforce.com slash commerce. Nicole, welcome to the show. Hey, Stephanie, so excited to talk with you. What are you secretly curious about? Okay, uh, what am I secretly curious about? I am secretly curious about um, Roblox. Okay. Do you have kids or have so, you just been hearing about it? Um, both. I do have children. Um, they're mm-hmm. on the younger side. Um, my nine-year-old isn't interested and she's probably, you know, the right age. Um, mm-hmm. So curious, not only from a parent perspective, but I'm very curious of just from um, a, a technologist's from perspective um, and, and, and from a human perspective, um, Roblox and the metaverse as a whole. Mm-hmm. Um how and why it motivates people um, to engage at the level that they're engaging in the space. Um, uh, Yeah. I like that. That's so we have the perfect interview for you to check out. Then we have another podcast called IT Visionaries and we had their CIO on of Roblox. And I didn't think I would be as interested until after listening and being like, whoa, this company's on a whole different level. They're playing a different game than us. Like we need to learn more about what they're doing. Super interesting. I am I absolutely going to yeah. check it out. Yeah, it's something yeah. that um, just the entire space, I think it's intimidating to admit that I don't get it um, and that I don't know a lot about it. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that it, but I'm, I'm curious, right? I'm not, I'm not a gamer. I don't spend um, time in the metaverse or frankly on social channels. Um, so it's a definitely a big leap for me um, and more than engaging in it for for like personal entertainment i just i really mm-hmm. want to understand i want to understand what it's about and and how how and why it motivates people let's jump over to chipotle you've been there for i think Great. 15 years i can only imagine all the transformations you've seen and all the different hats you've worn and so i would love to hear how you got into this space like what drew you to chipotle yeah um I, I've actually um, hit the 16 year mark at Chipotle. Oh, congratulations. Um, I thank you. Um, it was our purpose to cultivate a better world and, and the company's dedication to our values and food with integrity, you know, just real food prepared with classic culinary techniques in the restaurant that really drew me to the, to the, to the company. Um, I stay because I absolutely fell in love with the brand, with our culture, um, and with the people, people who work in and run our restaurants and the people I'm lucky enough to to work with every day. Um, I have seen incredible change. You know, when I started, we had just over 400 restaurants. Now we have more than 3,000. Um, yes, I've worn a few different hats over the years. Um, I think about it almost as four different companies with four very different um, positions for me, just as we experienced incredible growth over the past 16 years, as I experienced incredible growth, and just as, as the world around us and consumer behavior changed, and we were responding to that, right? I mean, in early days of starting what's become our product organization was should we do something about this e-commerce thing? We, we maybe think this isn't going away, right? Um, so it's, it's been an incredible journey. Amazing. So what does your, what is your day-to-day look like right now? Or what are some of the biggest problems you're tackling or things you're trying to solve for? Um, day-to-day is, is 
nonstop, a ton of fun. Um, I'm loving, we have a, a flexible work environment. So I'm loving some days at home, some days in office, some days at our innovation uh, cultivate center here in Southern California. Um, biggest problems, we're really tackling um, personalization at scale right at this moment. Um, we are very focused there and how we deliver incredible personalized experiences to our digital customers, um, whether in the digital or physical space. Um, also, um, expanding our digital system internationally. Lots of unique challenges there. It's very early days in international expansion for Chipotle. Uh, and of course, just, you know, taking care to always focus on the details for simple, frictionless, engaging digital experiences and, and never losing sight of, of why, you know, why we're at the front, why we're leading. And yeah. it's those experiences that we deliver. Well, so maybe for anyone who doesn't know and is still like, I still have been going in, in person at every Chipotle, how do you all play in the digital space right now? Like, what are some of the efforts you have underway? I mean, I saw that I think your digital sales hit, or it's projected to hit $3 billion. And you can tell me if that's not accurate, but that was a number I saw where I was like, holy cow, they have had huge yeah. growth. What's behind that $3 billion? So, um, Yes, we digital sales uh, did top three billion in 2021. So we have a website uh, where you can order order food. Uh, we also have a mobile app. Uh, more customers are coming through our mobile app uh, than web these days. But web is a good a good entry point for the first timer. Um, mm -hmm. We have an incredible loyalty program um, where the more you Chipotle, the more free Chipotle you're going to earn um, that has some fun gamification elements to it as well. You know, extras or bonuses um, and a rewards exchange where customers can choose what rewards they want and how often they want to, to redeem their points for the freebies. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got some really easy ways for customers to engage with us digitally to order, skip the line, get exactly what they want for pickup or for delivery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I hear that, I'm thinking a lot of it centers around frictionless ordering, being able to have it when you want it, quickly order, not have any barriers. Is that the biggest growth to the digital sales or are there other things you're dipping your toes into? Um, yeah, to basically like experiment with new technologies or new ways of interacting with your customers that maybe you haven't before? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think yes to both. So simple, frictionless, keeping order at the forefront is, is, is paramount. That's what mm -hmm. delivers an exceptional customer experience on digital. Um, and, and that's our North Star. We will continue to push boundaries and experiment and innovate. And we'll do that in, um, in, in lots of different ways. You know, currently I mentioned we are focused on bringing personalization um, deeper into the customer experience and into the customer journey. Um, we're also experimenting with um, artificial intelligence and cobiotics to enhance customer and crew member experience. So always looking for unexpected ways to show up um, and for opportunities to experiment and, and innovate without losing sight on you know, the core of this digital business, which is just simple, frictionless, let me order my food and get it the way I want it. Yeah. I remember when I was working in DC back in my good old Fannie Mae days and the first Chipotle popped up right near the office. And I was like, whoa, this is the best thing ever. We don't have to sit down. We can just zip on through. And yeah, yes. so it does seem like it's always been a core to, I mean, at least every place I've ever been and good to kind of keep your sights on that foundation where a lot of other folks could be losing sight maybe with all the new things popping up in the commerce it's space. easy to get distracted it's easy to get distracted right mm -hmm. um but access and convenience is is critically important and a space where we're always looking for new opportunities um we want to meet our customers where they are without losing sight of exactly what what we want to be the brand promises that that we've made of real food um exactly the way you want it fast yep so you mentioned cobiotics and AI, and I would love yes. to tackle what you all are doing around that. What are you all doing in that space? 
Absolutely. So um, collaborative robotics, so people and robots working together to achieve an outcome. Um, for us, it's we we're really focused on driving efficiencies in restaurant um, that'll enhance our employee experience and enable them to spend more time on um, culinary tasks and on the tasks that they really love doing uh, in mm-hmm. our in our restaurants. You know, they they love cooking, preparing the food. They love engaging and interacting with customers. Um, who loves standing over a, a fryer and making chips for hours a day or washing dishes, right? So we're trying to enhance that experience with technology. And we announced recently um, that we're testing Chippy. Uh, and Chippy is our autonomous kitchen assistant. Um, it integrates culinary traditions with AI to make our delicious uh, tortilla chips. So this has been a cool. partnership with um, technology culinary, uh, and operations, um, mm-hmm. to, to bring, to bring the first iteration of Chippy to life. I love that. Okay. How do you think about maybe the ROI behind something when thinking, okay, should I bring technology to this problem or is this still a human problem? Like how do you guys weigh the pros and cons when it comes to thinking about like where to implement technology and why? Yeah, I think it, it's often easy to say, here's the problem how can technology solve it? Because often there, there is a solve there. Um, but to your point, it's, is technology the right solution for the problem at the time? Um, and is the level of investment appropriate? Um, so, you know, really we look at whatever the problem at hand, is there, is there a human solve um, or, or, or something else? Um, and if technology, is there a tool in our toolbox that we have today that that might solve the problem or get us part way there, or is this is this greenfield brand new um, solution, new technologies we'd like to consider bringing to the table? Yeah, it, it'd be interesting thinking about serving employees. I used to work in a restaurant, and I when I came in, I was a silverware roller, and I would just roll silverware at Outback Steakhouse for eight hours a day until finally they're like, Stephanie, you made it. Now you can be a bus girl, and then kept moving my way up. <laughs> But there are certain things where I'm like, if you would have surveyed me, I would have told you it is not worth paying me my $5 an hour, whatever it was, to roll software all day. Is there any place for maybe your employees to say, hey, here's things that I'm not happy doing? Because I mean, in a way, if someone's not happy doing it, they probably shouldn't be, no matter how much money they're making, if they're not happy doing it, like you will not have good results, whether it's rolling silverware or busing, like you can only do a good job yes. if you love your work. I mean, that's how I view it. So have you ever surveyed employees to figure out what they do and don't like? Absolutely all the time. So that voice yeah. of our crew member comes through and informs um, digital experience roadmaps for for the restaurant experience, whether that's for customer or crew. Like, what pain points are you facing? What do you love about your job? Uh, what is frustrating about your job? What piece of your job would you rather not do? Um, and those are the areas where we'll really we'll really try to focus and see if there's technology um, solutions that we could put in place to make it better. Um, I think I think the other side of that is is what business challenges are we facing or might we be facing in the future, and could technology help alleviate those those business problems? You mentioned AI earlier. What are you all doing in the um, like around artificial intelligence? Yeah, so we're experimenting with uh, with a couple of things. Um, in addition to the work I've described with Chippy, uh, we have Pepper. Uh, so, oh yeah, so your concierge we, bot. That's right. So we like to name we like to name our technologies. Uh, so Pepper is our concierge bot, and he helps customers. Um, she helps customers uh, find answers to questions and mm-hmm. to to gain quick access to uh, issue resolution and, and customer care. Uh, so it's available today uh, via our mobile app and our website. Um, we are piloting um, access via Apple Business Chat. So, so being able to iMessage with Chipotle um, mm-hmm. for the reasons I just mentioned, as well as potentially order, because um, that sounds super simple to just pick up yeah. my pick up my phone and, and message Chipotle my order, um, yeah. as well as some other channels there. Um, we're also looking at other ways we can use um, artificial intelligence in the restaurant um, for customer and crew experience. So um, how can we be sure that we have fresh food, uh, fully stacked, fully stocked line available in 
every single restaurant from the moment we open until the moment we, cl we close every single day. Um, that's a problem that's going to be solved with a combination of human solution and technology solutions. So um, we're, we're looking to see, you know, how can artificial intelligence support our crew and restaurant managers in making sure they have all the food all the time for every single customer. Yeah. So for any companies thinking, you know, I want to build a bot, I want to be able to add technology into the mix. I mean, what are maybe some lessons you've learned as rolling out you know, these different services and pulling in AI into the mix? Like, what have you learned that maybe you're like, ah, oh, we did this and it was kind of, you know, had a little bumpiness around this and we would do it differently. Or we had a good lesson when it came to rolling out the bot and had to kind of adjust, you know, the marketing around it or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. just for anyone who's thinking about doing this for the first time. Um, it is not nearly as um, simple as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, um, not just a bot, we want a conversational platform. We want, yeah. um, you know, a collection of bots that service this customer experience um, with Pepper. And mm -hmm. it'll be brand, it'll be commerce, it'll be care. Um, and customers can access us through all these points. Um, and it'll be very conversational. And all of that is true and and visionary for what it will be um but it is more difficult to get there than i anticipated if i'm honest um mm -hmm. i think customers they want self-service and self-service is one thing um and they're okay with a bit more of a um bot type response in mm -hmm. knowing that that they're they're getting that self-service but truly to have that engaging um, synchronous back and forth with a persona um, is is a difficult a difficult thing to to build. Is it difficult because of all the connection points where you're having to kind of keep track of who's talking to you and where they're at and how to respond, or is it because maybe like the bot's not trained up enough and you know training it up was kind of a big feat to even be able to get it to respond correctly? Or what were the hardest pieces? Yeah. Uh, more, more the latter, um, just really taking the time and care to understand customer intents and what they, what they want from mm -hmm. uh, a bot or chat experience um, and what they expect in return, mm -hmm. and then figuring out all the connections and integrations necessary to deliver on that. Um, and just that continuous growth, continuous evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had on, it reminds me of a, a very old episode from the archives. I think she was in the first like 50 episodes. Um, someone from Stitch Fix came on, their VP of data science. Mm -hmm. And it was super interesting hearing about them using GPT-3 and how you have to be very conversational, but it depended on, for them, the age groups of who was conversating and how they would say certain things and phrase them versus, you know, a 60-something-year-old versus a 14-year-old. They just talk totally different. And Absolutely. It seems like it, it's advanced a lot since then, but still similar problems from what she was talking about, you know, a year or so ago still exist today. Yeah. And have you seen anyone kind of solving this well yet or where you're like, oh, I've interacted with a few bots here and it's gone really well and it's because of this? Sure. I think that there's um, there's a lot of examples of where pieces of it go really, really well. I think um, you know, some of the self-service and, and bot implementation for um, issue resolution with Amazon or with some of the delivery marketplace providers. Um, it's good. It, it's mm -hmm. to the point, it makes me feel taken care of, um, issue resolved, right? No bells yeah. and whistles, but it's done. Um, I think some of the, uh, examples where, I mean, Stitch Fix is a great one where it's, um, it's more gamified and interactive and definitely, has that um, machine learning over time to get smarter and smarter and more personalized. I think they're really nailing that. Um, yeah, I think you know there's there's definitely places where it's going well. Um, airlines would be would be another um, where I think they're they're starting to get it. You earlier just mentioned um, texting to get an order. And I've been having this thought, and you can tell me if you disagree with me, but I feel like consumers are moving to a place where they're starting to, reevaluate all their expenses with using 
middleman services to get them their things, whether it's, you know, delivery, the door dashes, whatever. Like, it seems like consumers are kind of pulling back on the wallet a little bit and being like, whoa, hold on. Now these fees are starting to catch up with me or now these platforms are charging extra fees. And when I hear you talk about directly texting and having an order done and having that one-to-one conversation with a relationship, I personally would choose that. But are you all seeing adoption around, you know, the text delivery or why do you think maybe this is a bet that you want to make? Is it because of any shifts in the environment? So specific to being able to text to order, it's just about convenience and giving our customers more access to Chipotle and and getting Chipotle to them um, Mm -hmm. in whatever way they'd like. Um, I agree consumer behavior is shifting a bit with the realization of the, the, the true cost of, you know, on the moment on, uh, sorry, in the moment or on demand delivery of all things. Mm -hmm. Um, I think when the reality of the true costs of that um, is realized to some is too much. Um, And we enable pickup experiences for that very reason. Um, And, um, as people are getting out and about again, mm-hmm. feeling a little more confident, a little safer about going into places and interacting with, with um, the folks who work there, um, we deliver that pickup experience for customers uh, as well. Yeah, cool. So if you zoom out a bit from Chipotle and you just look at the QSR industry as a whole, where do you think things are shifting or heading or what are you kind of what trends are you watching right now that maybe you personally are excited or interested in um trends that i'm excited about um i think the qsr space in general um is a little bit different than many commerce experiences right we have a very short window of time to engage with customers and to deliver on their expectations. Um, so that, that our space is, is a bit different. Um, I'm always looking at opportunities to make that experience in more engaging, more, um, more elegant and, and frictionless, but also um, as quick as possible uh, for our customers. So we've talked about some of the places that we're, we're looking to streamline uh, there. Um, but I'm really excited about user experience design, technology, and data um, coming together to deliver on brand promises and digital experiences for, con- for customers that are that are personalized, they're relevant, um, they're engaging. There's something that people want to be a part of. And I think we're at a very exciting place, those of us who play in the digital realm, um, where that's what's happening right now. That's what consumers are ready for. Um, and it's what it's what we're working to deliver. Yeah, yeah, it seems like we'll be eventually moving to a place where consumers, you know, even more so decide what data to share and how to play in that space and moving towards Web3 type of stuff. Like, what does that even mean? But I it's mean, a great question. as a brand, yeah, I was going to say, as a brand, how do you not think about Web3? Because I feel like that's a little far out there. But how do you, how, what success are you seeing when it comes to, you know, working with consumers and having them want to share this data data in like an excited way? Like, what are you offering to them or what's successful in that area? I think it's important that, that we offer them something of value, right? Don't just yeah. give me your data because it makes marketing to you easier and it makes me measuring my KPIs easier. And people are, uh, people are smart and increasingly protective of, of the data that they want to share and the information they want to give. So um, incentivizing customers to say, enabling me access to these pieces of your information is going to make the experience better for you. Want to save time at pickup? Let me track your location um, while you're using the app, for instance. Um, uh, you know, Join Chipotle Rewards. Um, tell us about your nutrition or dietary preferences. That'll enable us to better craft a digital experience for you, menu recommendations, um, you know, first access type experiences um, to our food and to, to menu options. 
the more we know, uh, the better that experience will feel for you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems like gathering that first party data too from your consumers will eliminate, I mean, so many companies having to maybe buy data to help them with these things instead shifting the model to like, well, what can I provide the customer that's so valuable that of course they're going to want to share the things that we actually care about. Like things that you can maybe buy from any other company. We don't care about those data points. We care about, like you said, nutritional and, you know, things that they are actually relevant to Chipotle, but then, yeah, how do you give them something of value? Um, that's awesome hearing. Yeah. How you guys are thinking about that. Absolutely. I would rather, I would rather use and uh, first party data and, and get customers to w share um, than, than purchase you know, third party information and sort of, and sort of guess how we stitch that together. Um, mm -hmm. We, we know a lot about a customer who purchases Chipotle regularly and the more that we can get you to share, then, you know, the better, the better for the experience for you moving, moving forward. Yeah. So when thinking about consumers, you know, really connecting with your brand. And I mean, to me, I'm like, yeah, Chipotle already has a crazy good brand, has a huge fan base of people who love you all. I mean, what other ways are you expanding that? Because when I look at, you know, where the world's headed, it seems like that is what consumers, they want to know where they're buying from. They want to know the story behind the brand. They want to feel like they're a part of it. Maybe they're a part of the new products. I mean, it seems like we're moving to a more like a world that's converging around brands and then the consumers like wanting to kind of do things together. So how is Chipotle leaning into that trend or, you know, making sure that they're pulling their customers in a way where they feel like they're a part of the company with them? First, I want to say that I, I think you're right. I absolutely love the direction that, that we are going in terms of, of how people are engaging with brands and what we expect from the brands that we are engaging with. Um, we expect them to be real and transparent and you know purpose driven brands like Chipotle's purpose to cultivate a better world really resonate with our customers and they look for opportunities to be a part of that um, for instance we have our real food print so after your um, digital order you're able to see um, five metrics on uh, sustainability metrics on your specific order um, cool. this order has helped support family farmers in this way, you know, this, this many acres of, of family farmland saved this much water, uh, because of the farming techniques that our suppliers and farmers use, um, et cetera. I think another way is, um, roundup for real change. So we're bringing our customers in the digital space along on some of the partnerships that, that we enter into by asking them to round up with their order. And you know, mm -hmm. we've raised over $10 million uh, since we first launched wow. this campaign for organizations, you know, 17 cents at a time, <laughs> uh, 47 cents at a time, whatever it is. Um, so I think consumers expect it. They, they want that, they don't want the, 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 that, that trust that they put in a brand to be taken lightly. Um, brands have to be real to that. and look for opportunities to bring them in, make them a part of it and bring them along. Yeah, I love that. I saw an initiative that you guys are doing around the farmers you work with and essentially putting them on this platform so everyone knows who your suppliers are so these farmers can get more business, which I'm like, well, yes. how many companies actually are like, here's my suppliers. Does anyone want to tap into them? Like most kind of hold those tight to their chest. What was the, yeah. I mean, that's beautiful, but what was the thinking behind that? I, am, I will tell you that we have an incredibly talented marketing team uh, that continues to show up in really unexpected ways and really put our purpose at the core of everything they do and all the decisions that they're making. And that is one incredible example of it. So helping uh, the farmers that we work with, our suppliers, um, establish direct-to-consumer ordering platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. All that. Super cool. Yeah. I was like, it's very inspiring. And like, you wouldn't really be able to connect like how this might help Chipotle. And, but it brings in a lot of interest in just a, such a new and different way that you don't see a lot of companies doing that. And I'm sure there's, of course, KPIs and other reasons to do it too, that maybe support that. But I mean, wow, how many lives and farmers companies that could change just from, you know, having a big brand like Chipotle behind them, supporting them and like putting them out in the world. Like that's really powerful. 
It is powerful. And it's frankly, an incredible thing to be a part of. And one of the primary reasons um, why I continue to absolutely love to be a part of the Chipotle team and, and what we do every day. Love it. All right. So the last thing I want to hear about is, I don't know if you have any ideas that people have ever disagreed with you on, but I want to hear if you do, what do you believe that maybe some people wouldn't agree with you on? And it can be in the QSR space. It can be in the world of e-commerce. It can be just a personal thing, but something that you've said before, people are like, mm, Nicole, I don't know if that's where the world's headed, or I actually don't think that's a good trend or whatever it may be. Okay. Um, yes, people have disagreed with me and I love that. I think that there is room for disagreement and friction. Um, absolutely. In, in, professional and personal relationships, and it helps get the best outcome uh, for what we're trying to do. Um, let me think of some specific examples. Um, I would, I think that some in the QSR and, and fast casual and, and fast food space uh, disagree with my perspective on on-site ordering and kiosks. Um, okay. From my perspective, uh, every consumer has a kiosk in their, in their pocket, and that's our digital devices. Yeah. Uh, and there is there is no added value uh, to making that investment uh, at a restaurant and having customers mm. place orders that way. I like that one. That's good. I can <laughs> see why a lot of people wouldn't ag agree with you on it, but I like that perspective. Okay, now yeah. what else? I want to hear more of these. <laughs> Anything else come to mind? <laughs> um, let's see, what else? Um, that one was top of mind. I'm trying to think if there's anything um, anything more recent. Um, this one's not as as clear cut, but I will say that keeping a an obsessive um, mentality to customer. Ex to, to, I'm gonna start that over. Like yeah. absolutely obsessing over user experience. Uh, and letting what you've defined as your design principles and your your north star whatever your guide and sticking to that as you are bringing new capabilities into your digital experience is a really difficult thing to do it is easy to get distracted it's easy to try to build experiences that are um, cluttered by trying to be everything to everyone and bring all the information all the time. Yes. So I think it's, a, um, you know, just a point of really great conversation and potential uh, friction within the teams as we try to solve problems and, and make sure that we're delivering these experiences for our customers is it right? Is it true? Is it, um, you know, does it, does it build toward the strategy that we've outlined and does it meet our design principles here or are we compromising and are we willing to make that compromise? And then how many compromises are we willing to make? Wow. Okay. So now I feel like it's about to get into a, um, me building mission type of question, because this is something we're thinking through right now of having, okay core pillars of like, does this answer, you know, does this do this, this and this? How do you guys, I mean, do you have certain pillars that every product decision rolls up to where you're like, it has to check all three of these boxes to even move forward? Or like, what does that process look like? Okay, so we do. Um, we have a stage gate process at Chipotle, where we bring innovation through our stage gates. And our checks are pretty simple. Is it good for the customer? Is it good for operations? Um, and is it good for financials? And now it doesn't necessarily have to be like um, a slam dunk 100% green across mm -hmm. all three. Um, but those are the checks that we're making um, each step of the way as we bring innovation through that pipeline. And they're great lenses for us to look through and remember that um, it's great for the customer, but if it's really difficult for operations, then, then maybe that's not a win. And to your question earlier in the conversation around 
you know, ROI on technology investments. Sometimes maybe an overinvestment is worthwhile um, in order to deliver on that customer and ops experience. And sometimes maybe it's a check that you need to say, not, not at this point. Um, we also within product have product design principles um, that we are regularly reminding our teams of and ensuring that each of our, um, you know, each new feature uh, meets those design principles and that we don't lose, we don't lose them along the way. So how are you maybe marketing that to the team in a way that they're constantly reminded? Is it through a format when maybe they're like, hey, I have a new product idea or a new way of doing something? Do they have to kind of go through the principles to then submit something new? Or is it like plastered all around them wherever they are to be like, ah, that's what I should be thinking about when thinking of new ideas? Or how do you ingrain that into the culture? Yeah, I think reminding people of our company strategy, technology strategy and product strategy on a regular basis is is mm -hmm. key to making sure that we're all clear and rowing in the same direction. Um, yeah. So that's one. Um, find opportunities to not necessarily plaster it all over, um, but find opportunities to remind, have it be a part of conversations, um, presentations, et cetera. Um, and as, in terms of new ideas, I'd say let the ideas flow, bring all the ideas, um, but pretty early on, let's, let's discuss, does that ladder up to one of our, one of the, one of our strategies? Um, what is that going to, to, help us progress on. Awesome. Well, that is a perfect way to end this interview. Nicole, thank you so much for hopping on here with me today. Where can people find more about you and all the cool work you're up to at Chipotle? Thanks, Stephanie. It's been a great conversation. Um, like I mentioned, I'm not too active on social channels, but you can definitely find me on LinkedIn, Nicole West. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. If you're looking for the number one platform for all things commerce, there's no better choice. So definitely go check it out at salesforce.com slash commerce.